Welcome back to Anderson's TV, everybody. Uh, my special guest today is Warren Hewitt from Produce Like a Pro, although, of course, in my eyes, he will forever be most famous for having worked with me at Anderson's yeah. back in the 1990s. Early uh, 1990s, yes, when we were both eight. <laughs> um, now, we have a very popular series on uh, Anderton's TV where we get our guests to pick a rig for under a thousand pounds. We create this pretense that you're on the way to a gig uh, and you have a little bit of a car accident just outside Anderton's and all of your gear is written off. You're OK, but the gears are gonna <laughs> and you've got to run into Anderton's and replace the I gear. I didn't destroy any other cars. No, There's no, uh, no ambulances are involved. No, <laughs> I don't okay. think so. Uh, <laughs> yes, the only victim is the gear. Okay. Um, so you've got a thousand pounds now. Because you are of produce like a pro fame, I thought what we'd Thanks do is work, we, would, we would change. We're not on the way to a gig. We're on the way to a session. A recording session. That a makes sense. A recording session. Yeah. So not only have you had to choose your gear for a thousand pounds, we're going to also interrogate you as to like, how would you mic this up? Why have you chosen this for a session rather than... Um, rather than a gig. What is your go-to recording setup? I mean, look, I'd be lying if I didn't say the 57 is a great way to start. Everybody knows that the characteristic of the 57 is that kind of high mid kind of boost. I presume from my memory, a presence lift about three to seven K makes guitars a bit more aggressive. Certainly great on snare drums as well. But I think somebody once said to me, I think somebody smart like Al Schmidt, who's far smarter than I will ever be, said, you know, a 57 with a Neve 1073 and maybe an 1176 on it with a little bit of compression is the sound of so many of the most famous guitar sounds we've ever heard, particularly obviously during the 70s when yeah. every other studio had Neve consoles. So it's a tough one to ignore. There mm -hmm. are lots of very beautiful, expensive and nicer microphones in some ways, but you do know you're going to get a good guitar sound if you've only got a 57, and there we have well, one. We handy. only have a 57. Okay, in good. terms of, uh, but amp and guitar wise, you know, I mean, yep. I know you're probably, you know, better known now for being behind the desk rather than, you know, behind the mic yeah. or whatever, but you can play and you still do play. But so what would be, you know, if, if you got a call and it was like, Warren, can you come down and record some guitar for us, please? But, you know, and you had right. to bring a, an amp and a guitar, what, what would you bring? Well, I think that there's a common misconception, um, maybe not that much of a misconception now because of the wonderful world of YouTube and in freely available information. When bands used to turn up at studios when I was a kid, they would turn up with Fall Below Marshall Stacks, thinking, yeah. we want a big guitar sound. And that's just a loud guitar sound. Right. You know, when you turn it down, it's not a bigger guitar sound, it's just a loud. And so working with people like Dave Jordan when I was engineering and also as a musician, I realized that his big guitar sounds quite often were just little combos. Uh, in fact, he used to get massive guitar sounds at like six or eight inch speakers. So, top of my head, I actually don't know what size in the Blues Junior. Is it's it a eight? 112. No, it's a 112. Oh, it's a 112. Okay, so it's great. not, in fairness to, to Warren, so we've, sometimes when we shoot these videos, we kind of show the shopping process. We've, we've done that already. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Warren was like, I, I, I want to, Telly and a, and, a, and a little tube amplifier, and so what? And, and we fairly quickly, in fairness, just went well. You actually asked for a champ first. I did. Didn't the you? champ turns out to be like five or six hundred pounds. Could work well, more, no, no. way more, more yeah. Because they don't now do like um, an afford. The only champ they do is like the fifty-seven custom shop reissue type thing. Ooh. So the you know that there's a small. I think there is a baby brother to this called the Pro Junior that's got no reverb and does have, that have this of sort of yeah. closest to a champ, I suppose. But yeah, we, yeah. we went with the Blues Junior. Yeah. It's probably the biggest selling valve amplifier of all time Good. ever. Uh, and is a, that used up about 550 to 600 pounds worth of our budget. Right. But let, OK, so let, I'm see that has always intrigued me. You yeah. know, when, when I hear of like a lot of the particularly through the 70s and the 80s, I, I, you know, you see that like the Fender Princeton just appears on so many guitar tracks, even Gainey stuff. Probably the Deluxe 65 is probably the most famous, right. most, this is probably, not definitely, but from all the session guitar players I know, mm -hmm. like in LA and stuff, which is a lot of them, they will always turn up almost every time with a, with a Deluxe 65. Right. Either original or reissue. But what, so what is it? What is it about that? Again, look, I, I, I'm, this is all 
stuff that my brain's trying to, to, to remember now. But, you know, Steve Lukather on all the Michael Jackson stuff, I'm sure is a Fender Princeton. Um, Maybe, yeah. And who is it? And I know just from talking to my, you know, the, uh, Phil X, who, you know, hugely influenced by Eddie Van Halen, some yeah. of the biggest, you know, guitar players. I just did that because Steve told me, by the way, right. that this, that, that part, everybody mm -hmm. thinks that's Eddie. That's Steve. Right. Okay, yeah. so and he also Eddie plays does the, bass the solo line. and Steve does all the rhythm yeah. stuff, doesn't he? Yeah, all the rhythm, all that stuff. But you think it's an Eddie thing. But I know. But I he know. also played bass on it because he had to match. Da, 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 da. So he's playing the bass and the guitar. But I, I know, yeah, so Phil X tells a story that Eddie Van Halen has this huge collection of little magnetone combos that, right. you know, a lot of his big, you know, driven sounds were from. So, hmm. look, there'll be plenty of people out there, I'm sure, with better stories than that. Right. But okay, so, but okay, so from an engineer's, a recording perspective, sure. Why then is perhaps a small amp bigger sounding? Well, yeah, I, a couple of things. Um, I love Marshalls. I think I have three that we use, and uh, JMP is my mm -hmm. main Marshall, and probably a lot of the guitar sounds I do. I also have Pro Juniors, talking of, mm -hmm. of the smaller ones, which I love. Um, AC15 is mm -hmm. one of my favorite amps, really nosy, mid rangey. Ultimately, when I plug a Marshall into a Marshall stack, it's really, really loud. But I put mm. a 57 on it, it, it's, it doesn't hold the same. If I want to mic up the guitar amp in the room, mm. and getting a lot of volume can really create some really low end resonance depending on the rooms. That's kind of a nice effect. Mm. But there is no advantage to me in a right. 412 except for volume. Right. So when you're dealing with a small cab, one of the things that's quite fun, which I don't think we need to do with this, but can be done, is you can, with an open back, you can front and back mic. Okay. So you flip the polarity so it's reversed on the back and then dial it in lightly and there's more low end coming out the back. Mm -hmm. And Dave Jordan would do that all the time with small combos. So he would have the front mic, which he might put up at zero, and then just start bringing that flipped polarity mic and just dial in a bit of low end. You've got to be careful. If it gets too even, it starts to sound cloudy. But just a little touch of it, fills in some of the low end. Well, would you want to do that on an amp like this? I mean, we, we, we could allow you. I don't think microphones have to be purchased within our budget. So would you, I mean, we can put two 57s on here. We sure. could do it. It's, um, it's up to Danish Pete in there to get, uh, to <laughs> well, get no, some of the blend. Let's see. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting. So we've yep. got, we got a little Fender combo. Yep. Um, your, you know, your obsession with Telecasters is... I love so, Telecasters. Yeah, all, all but the videos my, that we've my, done with you so far. Yeah. But this one in particular, you're a thin line fan, right? I, I just think a couple of things. Um, I like all Telecasters, as you said, but I do like Deluxes and Customs with, with Humbuckers. And then the thin line is like... Because I think, think when you and I were working together, my main guitar was the 335. Yes, yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah. I may have even bought my 335 directly as a result of your influence around 335. They're such great guitars. Yeah. But then I love Telecasters. And I know this is not a glued neck and it's not like, you know, carved toppy, fancy or whatever, but this is something about a thin line I love. I think the little reduction in weight, the thing that's got an F hole. I don't know, every thin line I've played that Fender make, whether it's the 150 pound one all the way through to the whatever, just sound great. <laughs> sound really good. I was really blessed actually, Seymour Duncan uh, wound some thin line pickups for uh, uh, for me. So yeah, I don't know. Well look, so that- I that, love thin lines. The good news is there is a thin line within the Squire Classic Vibe range, which yeah. we have here. So we've still, out of our thousand pounds, got probably 50, 60 pounds spare. Yeah. So we've put some affordable pedals on the floor. Yeah. You're only able to probably afford one and a half of them. <laughs> um, maybe we, so. I put four drive pedals, which get progressively. I found fifteen pounds in my yeah. back pocket, so I'm going to get two. <laughs> so the the first four in the chain get sort of progressively gainier as you get as you go up. Yeah. Obviously, you can. We haven't adjusted them to taste yet. And then the last one is a, an echo pedal. So um, we could roughly ish for a thousand pounds buy essentially two of these pedals, that guitar and that amplifier. It's probably ninety percent of the guitars that I do as a producer, a songwriter, musician, etc. You know, in that order mm -hmm. um most of my guitar playing stuff um when it comes to like rock production stuff is probably you know on a chorus maybe a high line kind of like 
you know, all those kinds of things. This without the mic on it, by the way, everybody. So oh, yeah, we're just going to run like this for the minute, yeah. But that essentially, you know, um, you know, maybe some single line kind of... You know, it's not as much as I want to. I'm not getting hired and nobody's paying for it. You know, all the fancy, leady stuff, 90% of rock production is rakes, is driving mm. parts, you know, the guitar is there to reinforce. Joe Pass said it, doesn't it? Um, years ago, he said, uh, why do guitar players spend their whole lives playing solos when 99% of the time they're playing rhythm? You know, so for me, a, a clean tone is never quite clean. I like a little bit of crunch. Yeah. Um, if I, I know for metal guys, they have two tones, don't they, really, essentially. I'm, I'm oversimplifying. The cleanest sound you've ever heard or the heaviest rip your head off. Yeah. I think for us more classic rock, maybe blues influenced players, our clean is playing softer. Yeah. It's, it's going, you know, this. It's probably just. That's clean, but. And I like that. I, I like that sort of feeling. So my gain pedal is probably just to add a bit. Yep. Because well, I've already got distortion. I, I, you know, without naming any names, one, what, how many times yeah. has a band come in and the guitar player put all the parts down and then they've gone for lunch and you've redone the parts? <laughs> Obviously, you don't have to know. It just because I think I think what you're saying is like there well, are I, some... I can tell you some that I think is absolutely fine. i and I and I can name drop some bigger names because um. Like, I did three albums with Ace Freely, who's obviously very famous for being Kiss's guitar player. And when it comes to, like, doing the boring, bog-standard stuff, he doesn't care. He has no ego. Right. His, his thing is his solos and the guitar riffs that he writes. Yeah. So if he gives me an album, like, I co-produce some stuff with him and I mix some stuff, and if I have to go in there and add kind of... <laughs> If I have to add some rah, rah in stereo to lift that chorus, right. he doesn't give a rat's ass. Okay. He has no ego involved in it. Um, and when I've replayed some stuff, it's usually because it's, it's... Sometimes what happens when you're working with inexperienced musicians is you spend so long working with them and getting it perfect that it has no soul because there's got to be that fine line of... of do you know what I mean? Where it, it feels a little bit angsty, a bit performed, mm -hmm. and it's really tough to get that from somebody, you can get it really tight and really in tune. It's probably the problem with all modern music. You get it tight, you get it in tune, but there's no, like, all the charisma and the personalities disappeared. Yeah. So when I've had to replay stuff with some of the less experienced bands, it's because maybe they have played it after editing and replaying and punching in. We've got the part right, and then I come back and listen to it the next day, I'm like, oh, it wow. sounds so boring. Sort of lost that initial... Yeah, because... So... But I've worked with them really, really hard. I hate, Dave Jordan taught me this. Dave Jordan told me he'd never, ever replaced a musician until he did, uh, I think it was Social D, sorry, Social D. Uh, I think the drummer, they ended up retracking drums on, on an album. Mm -hmm. um, I think that big album with the ball and chain. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but he, he didn't like doing that. I think it's our job mm -hmm. as producers to work the musicians really hard because they're paying you. Mm -hmm. And if it just takes a bit longer and you have to work harder, I think the I think the point was that you, I'm sure there are loads of guitar players out there that, like you say, have got all the flash stuff. Yeah, yeah. But it's just like the meat and potatoes. If you can just, you know, and that's uh, that's where I've heard stories. It's like yeah. you, you go for lunch now, and I'll just literally just do the the, yeah. the A to D yeah. bit, so that when you it's just done, then you know. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> Ace was really good. And then I remember on the I think it was the last or second to last album I did with him. Um, they he did a we did a cover. Um, Thin, Thin Lizzy's one of my favourite bands. I'm mm -hmm. sure they're one of your favourites as well. He did a cover of Emerald. And there is a, a section in that where it does this kind of almost spinal tap. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. It's all with an Irish harmonies. accent as well. Yeah, yeah with an Irish accent. It, uh, Michael Flattery comes out and uh, River dances it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so, so there's, it has this kind of moment there. And um, he... he he was doing some shows because he never stopped working. He was like working the whole time. And he calls me up and he's got, you know, it's a haste and he's like, hey, Warren. And I'm like, yeah, he goes, da da, that harmony thing. I ain't got time to do it. You do it. So I played the, you know, the da 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 did the harmony and everything. And um, unbeknownst to me, album comes out, credits, because it was him and Jewel 
on, mm-hmm. on our couch, my wife and I's couch, Slash was sitting on one side and Ace was sitting on the other. Slash was playing, uh, do you remember my, do you remember that, sorry, the bare-faced guitar that, you remember that one, that Les Paul one? It was really ugly and it was ribbed. Maybe. It was yeah, really, yeah. okay. It was, yeah, it was BFG. Yes. Yes, yeah. yes, 100%. Really ugly guitar, yeah. but fantastic guitar. Right. Like, you know, how something, you're just looking at it. Yeah. We were talking earlier about yeah. the way guitars look influence how we think we're going to hear. Yeah. You look at this guitar, you think it's going to be terrible. But I don't know, I think they put the, the what was their high gain? Dirty pickup? Fingers thing. It had, had the yeah. Dirty Fingers mm-hmm. in it. And so it had this like amazing guitar sound. And Slash walks into the studio at our house, was like, oh, I didn't bring a guitar. Do you have a Les Paul? And so I just kind of handed him sheepishly this guitar. He plugged in. I was like, "This is great." You know, Gibson would never give him a, yeah. a guitar like that to use. So, um, you know, they're both through Marshalls, dueling solos on Emerald. There's like goes on for like three minutes at the end of the song, and then he has me replay the the or play sorry the the bridge harmony guitar part. Record comes out. It's got guitars, Ace Freely slash Warren Hewitt. Nice. Frame that one. Yes. Absolutely. It's pretty, pretty awesome. Okay, well, look, quickly run through your four pedals. Yes. Uh, and then choose which ones you like. Uh, and then we'll talk about, we'll mic up and then we'll see what it all sounds like. So, I, what have we got? What, are, who, right. what kind of pedals so, are these? The cream one, sweet yep. cream, low gain, yep. uh, lots of volume boost. So, probably going to drive the natural gain within the amplifier more than from the pedal. We haven't put the mic on it yet. Do you want to do that first? Yeah. Okay, well, let's do that first. Do you want, and should we do the front and back thing? We've never actually done a front and back mic guitar cabinet in here before, oh, okay. I, I don't think. So, uh, this is the back of a um, Blues Junior, but without the, uh, the wooden plate on it, which, as you can see, is incredibly important to leave on to avoid electrocuting yourself. <laughs> So before you attempt to... Um, I've never done mic- it with an app yes. like this before. So, so before but you, you attempt so to, to, to mic up the back of an amplifier, uh, I'm not even... I, disclaimer, on screen now, um, yeah. this is probably a really bad idea. <laughs> you shouldn't do it, especially if you have people so uh, like young children running around your house or you don't know what you're doing. But obviously, do not put your hands or anything <laughs> metal anywhere near... Uh, exposed electrical things. Warren is a trained professional. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, so where, you need the mic to be really close to the speaker, yeah. you said, so don't what, you? So basically what we would do is we'd have a 57, which is actually quite a perfect yeah. kind of slim mic to come in there. And what you've got is you've got a cone that looks like this, obviously. Yeah. So the mic comes up here and then on the other side. So basically... So they're up. almost equidistant on either side exactly. of the cone, yeah. either. That's the point. Then, that's the point. And then you right. just flip the polarity on the other one, because obviously when the speaker's going that way, the waveform's doing yeah. this, and you want to make sure they're both hearing it the same direction. Right. And I, I if guess you if they're not almost... equidistant, you, the, the, yeah. even if you flip the polarity, you're going to have phasing issues, because they're too, one's much closer to the speaker than the other. Yeah, you know? try to get the same kind of distance away. So if that's the cone in the middle here, the, the mics are like this. All so, right. Well, we'll flip it back round, and we'll find a stand that's uh, suitable. This one probably looks more suitable yep. uh, and we'll get that mic in there and so, try not to electrocute yourself yes so but before we do that because then we can just have one nice cut here um, on the front now as I said it's important I think most speaker cabinets are going to have a grill in front of them yep. which always makes it slightly more difficult to see where the speaker is yep. so you can either do what I'm doing now you can kind of feel yep. the incision feel or the you incision. can use what a, a great name for a band <laughs> um, <laughs> So, yes, my <laughs> terrible second album. Um, so. <laughs> I, need, I need something to do my terrible first yes. album. Um, so. so, obviously, the, the, the misconception yeah. here would be if anybody thinks that g- combos always have the speaker in the middle, because they yeah. often don't. Um, you, sometimes you see people with a torch, don't they? Trying yeah, to I was see going to say torch, it. or for the American audience, flashlight. Flashlight. Yep. Um, so where would you now? The middle of the the speaker normally has a dust cap on it. Yeah. Um, and what might you Tra- refer to that as? Traditionally, the uh, um, people will say that the if this is the so that's the center about yep. here, that would be the brightest part of the speaker. Mm-hmm. Quite often, it's not always, but sometimes it's metal. So you would imagine it to be brighter. The edge uh, tends to be the darkest. So in theory, you can put a mic here and it will be a little darker and a little brighter. It is a little darker and it is a little brighter. It is not absolutely massive, yeah. but it definitely 
you know, and so most guys and girls I know that are good engineers usually just take a mic and put it somewhere in the middle between the two areas. Somewhere in the middle between the middle and the edge. And this whole yeah. axis thing that you see, so that would be a front on, and then sometimes well, you see people moving a mic. Well, that's, that's the sort of theory, isn't it? So if you do it like that, um, quite often, so Dave, Dave's thing, Dave Jordan, that is, um, is to, he, because he's, he's double micing things like this, he'll take the two mics and do this, so right. they're opposite each other. Mm -hmm. So this back one is coming in, like, uh, I see at an angle slightly. Yeah, because if yeah. so, it's doing this. Does that yeah. does mm -hmm. that equate on a camera yeah, yeah, yeah. from here? Yeah. So not this, but this because this the cone is like that. So he's seeing it so that the 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 cardboard or whatever it's made out of hemp sometimes is moving like this. So yeah, it's it's look like most things in life, it's kind of logic. And then. <laughs> Are you often hear people using a, a yeah. different microphone technique for, say, a cleaner guitar sound than a heavily overdriven guitar sound? Have you, would you suggest that there yeah, are sort I of like, simple techniques? I like large diaphragm microphones for super clean tones. It's right. nice to get that sparkly top end. It's kind mm -hmm. of logical. If it's like really, really nice and clean. I've used 57s as well, but there is something beautiful about a traditional old school, you know, U87, mm -hmm. pulled back a little bit, get in the whole sound. As long as the room isn't unbelievably reverberant, or mm -hmm. unless you want that, um, we, for instance, we did a track with the Frey. Um, there was a guitar. Oh, it's the You Found Me. There was this guitar overdub, which sounded really super distant and reverby. Mm -hmm. We put the, a small. It was a sixty. Actually, it was a deluxe sixty-five, and we put it in a slate room, close mic'd it, pulled it up, and was like, "Oh, there's quite a lot of reverb on this already." And then we, so we started pulling the mics back and mm -hmm. miking it, and then opening the door and miking the live room, and then you got this huge guitar sound, you know. Sometimes that can be to your benefit, but typically speaking, um, people like to close mic and then mm. add reverb to taste in the mix. Cool. Right, well, let's do that. So we've got two, <laughs> two microphones on here. We've obviously, yeah. as you rightly said, we've got to flip the polarity of the back one, otherwise they'll be working so against each other. So that's up to Danish Pete in there. Don't um, mess this up. Let, let's now stomp through these pedals. Yep. Um, and... By the time we get to this session that you've got to be, you'll have been sacked because what's the first rule of being a session guitar Not player? Not be four and a half hours late choosing gear. Exactly, kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay, so just stomp through them and see what well, you tell me, tell right. me about sweet, the sweet right. cream. What sweet is it? cream. It's a, as far as I'm aware, it's one of. It's not a copy of another pedal, although I'm sure okay. there are loads of other pedals that are more about a boosted, gainy sound rather Touch. than. Yeah, that's just tone basically. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> Oh, so you, you've engaged the fat I did because so I wanted there's to hear quite, that. There's quite a bit of gain on the amplifier Oh, now. is that that's a gain? Yes. I thought it was going to be low end. It's more mid-range uh, gainy right. thing. We have de disengaged the yep. fat. It's so quite that, tasty. that tone is going to change depending on the amp. So that what you're hearing now is basically a, by engaging the sweet cream, you're really just driving the amp much harder. Good. Blues Breaker is based, oh, it's not even called that, is it? Blues Man is based on the Blues Breaker. This is l like a vintage Blues Breaker. It doesn't really do anything unless everything is like three quarters of the way up. So that distortion is more coming from the pedal than what the What did you think about them when we were kids and that came out? What? I, was, I was kind of underwhelmed. <sighs> uh, and then it became a pedal that people started to really this, get into. I mean, this is the bonkers world that we live in. Yeah. So yeah, you're, do you know what, isn't that mad, isn't it? So yeah, again, back in the dark ages when we were selling guitars and pedals as nippers, yeah. The, yeah, the, the back end of the 80s, Marshall came out with the governor yeah, and yeah. the blues breaker and all that kind and of we, stuff. Everybody was kind of and underwhelmed. They, yeah, they were a 50 quid pedal and I think most people just went, I'll still have the Boss one, please. Yeah, the DS1 was yeah. still an amazing pedal. Earlier this year, Marshall reintroduced them and holy bejeebas, we, probably in a month sold a thousand pedals just anderton's one retailer so imagine how many they sold in the world although in fairness again it was like within three months it was almost like everyone that wanted one bought well, one I and think, then it went back to normal i think both um graham coxon and johnny greenwood 
use the blues. Mm. Uh, blue, I think they use definitely either the governor or the blues. Yeah, but the governor's blues. actually probably of all the pedals. The governor was the one I thought was a slightly more unique marshally kind of tone, and, right. and I really, I really like that pedal. But you know, you as soon as anyone like John Mayer or or, or Joe Bonamassa or whatever gets a blues breaker pedal and it becomes part of their thing, then instantly a whole army of you know, guitar dads like me just go, oh, I better have a blues breaker pedal then. Um, so anyway, that's that one. The Durple, you have to say nice things about the Durple. That is the pedal that Danish Pete collaborated with Tone City on to make a drive sound. So that's a bit more, I don't know, like a, like a blues rock country kind of great with the Telecaster. Mid range baby. That's fun. Yeah, and then the I, I may have misunderstood when you were originally talking about pedals that you liked. You said you liked the DS1 kind of quite a distorted distortion. No, uh, D distortion plus MXR. Uh, well, look, the Wild Fire is yeah. the most distortiony of okay. the ones. So I don't know where that set is not. <laughs> I so, mean, that's the most fun. Yep, the wild fire, the, you mean the red and one. And the sweet cream might be the one that I would need on the session. No problem. So sweet cream, and then if you want some delay, again, are you a, you, you know, would you typically like expect guitar players to just have their own delay pedal, or yep. is that a post-production kind of effect? It, it or? can be, um, but I learned, again, from Dave Jordan, um, such an amazing producer and engineer yeah. but he would always want to hear what the band brought in because you're trying to create something unique you're trying to get the best out of the musician so if a musician comes in and he's got five pedals he or she's got five pedals and they've set them up a certain way for mm. a certain guitar sound you know at least use that and start from that and try and improve on it rather than going no you need to do it like this because then you're destroying all the individuality and the creativity he's play us out with a few minutes of why you chose uh, this telly, this Blues Junior, a sweet cream and a tape machine. Sweet, sweet cream and a tape. <laughs> well, let's let's bring this You've sweet got a bit of cream sound down going a little on bit. There. Yeah. Start without it. Do you want I a little like bit less, a little less, less delay? Yes. Yeah.
I've got to be honest, I love this. It's £379. Yes. It's pretty amazing. Mad, isn't it?